that. Um, cool, so thank you for having me here and Avril for inviting me. It's really nice to be um, asked to participate um, in this network. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about today grows out of my doctoral research, which um, examined museums and cultural heritage sites, so here in Aotearoa and in Australia and the US as well. Um, and through that project, my interest became um, focused on the environment as a, a space of contestation in settler places. Um, and I've become especially interested in sites of public pedagogy or public instruction, um, which are also machineries of public memory. Um, we don't tend to think of the zoo, I think, as a machinery of memory. When you go to the zoo, um, you see the animals on display. It's quite immediate and quite present, like you were there and the animals there and, and you're kind of there together in this moment. Um, but the timescales of the zoo, I think, point to the memory work that the zoo is engaged in. Um, so there are daily routines of visiting and feeding and sleeping. Um, and there are also the times of reproductive cycles and life cycles. And they, in turn, map onto deeper times to do with evolution and extinction. Um, so the project that I've just begun to pursue is premised um, on the idea that the zoo performs special identity work in a settler place. Um, seems quite an obvious thing to say, but settler places like the one that we're in um, are premised on um, takeover and makeover. They're subject to acts of reorganisation um, that fundamentally alter the life world in that place. So um, new species are shipped in, um, acclimatisation projects get underway, um, and economic imperatives um, take hold the land um, might be drained and cleared and, and kind of turned into pasture. Um, locally endemic species um, are overrun or, or become um, extinct or are, are kind of hunted out, these sorts of things. Um, quite belatedly, our country has come to realise this. Um, so the OECD, I was reading um, the other day, the OECD has noted um, that in a global context, New Zealand has a special responsibility for biodiversity conservation since a high percentage of its 90,000, it's not a typo, 90,000 species are endemic and unique. Um, and Jan Wright, who's the New Zealand Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, um, has explained that around 90% of our um, birds and insects are found nowhere else on Earth. Um, just to put this in perspective, um, she says in Great, Brit Great Britain, um, there's only one unique native animal. It's a small bird um, known as the, the Scottish crossbill. <laughs> um, so this sort of fascinating wow. point of comparison. Um, so settler histories, um, we might expect to be quite deeply troubled when it comes to animal lives and animal futures. Um, Deborah Bird Rose, um, Australian anthropologist whose work um, it's really important to me, um, refers to settler environmental transformation as death worlding, wow. is her term for it. Um, our own government says the same thing, doesn't quite use that term death worlding, um, but if you look to something like um, the New Zealand government's biodiversity strategy, um, you'll find there that um, there are statements um, like the fact that nothing since the extinction of the dinosaurs compares with the loss of biodiversity in our country. Um, since European settlement. So we turn out to be a world leader in this place when it comes to scrambling um, a life world, um, creating conditions where locally endemic um, plants and animals can't survive. Um, so as a, a kind of a preface to what follows, um, I might say that to consider the environment in a set of place is to confront the hard facts of um, world beaten rates of species extinction and ecosystem decline, um, which can be understood, I think, as accelerated forms of what Rob Nixon, Nixon has termed slow violence. Um, and I think to consider the environment in settler places is also to confront um, the hard fact of a life world um, carved up into differentiated zones of care, um, made it over into a domain of what Deborah Bird Rose calls. Um, man-made mass death. Um, New Zealand is not particularly associated with um, grim death work internationally, um, marketed as a clean, green, the South Seas paradise, the sort of um, ecological wonderland that we live in. Um, and it's been at the forefront of a range of conservation 
um, initiatives globally. So um, the use of island sanctuaries for the recuperation of species is a, is a New Zealand um, initiative. Um, but this, I think, is interpretable um, as a sign that one of the key things to emerge from settler conditions um, is profound changes to human-animal relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and these changes, in turn, crystallise um, the workings of a larger set of ideas about how the life, life world is composed, um, how it might be cared for and managed. So, so some kind of difficult environmental legacies um, play out in these places. Um, in a settler place, um, the time of the zoo turns out to be the time of the nation. So um, menageries and sanctuaries and zoos were founded um, in the early days of a country like New Zealand. These institutions um, track changing attitudes to the environment. Um, and zoos um, themselves work constitutively, I think. They produce um, an idea of the place that you're at, like the idea of New Zealand, um, and they produce the public of that place as well. So uh, we might think of a zoo um, as, a, as a machinery of identity as well as um, a machinery of memory. Um, when you go to the zoo, or you go to a wildlife sanctuary, um, you have an experience of being taught how to belong and how to care. Um, there are all sorts of ways this could go wrong because these histories are so difficult. Um, so you'll be encouraged to remember um, in a certain kind of way in order that the idea of New Zealand um, is going to hold together and you'll be able to feel like you belong to this place. Um, there's often um, substitution or displacement that will be at work. Um, so at Auckland Zoo, for instance, if you go there, um, you'll find that um, discussions around um, habitat loss, um, endangerment, these sorts of things, um, will generally be figured through um, species like the orangutan or the Sumatran tiger, um, or it'll be displaced onto uh, the palm oil plantations in Borneo, um, much easier to ask the zoo going public to think about those things than it is to talk about um, the longfin eel and, mm. and destruction of wetland habitats mm. um, in this kind of place. Um, so my specific interest in pursuing this project um, is in thinking about um, difficult animal species, species that pose problems for the settler places that they inhabit, um, because of something to do with their history or because of the identity work um, that they perform or expose. Um, so creatures that have the capacity to reveal um, an uncomfortable or shameful set of circumstances that underwrites um, settler history. Um, that's my interest. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a couple of these species, um, the longfin eel um, or tuna um, and the brush-tailed possum as well. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about something to do with that slide that's up there, um, the, the, the kind of dog food scandal that emerged around um, the long fin field um, in recent years. Um, this is where my interest in the, the long fin eel originated. Um, so the, the eel is um, endemic to this country. Um, it's been under the spotlight of legal and parliamentary process um, in large part because news reports emerged um, maybe three years ago or so, um, claiming that the eel was being used in the commercial production of dog food for the export market. Um, and in fact, it was. So this picture shows um, one of the offending products. Um, the long fin eel by that time had been classified as a species at risk and in decline. Um, so this is a conservation status that places it um, in the same category as the great spotted kiwi, um, the New Zealand falcon, which graces our $20 note, um, and the kiriru as well, so the eel um, in the same category but um, being used for dog food. Um, at the time when these reports surfaced, um, the longfin eel had just turned up in Auckland Zoo for the first time in that zoo's almost 100 year history. Um, the eel exhibit, maybe if you could flip to the next slide, um, the eel exhibits part of this um, Te Waunui um, um, New Zealand precinct that's been um, developed at the zoo. Um, and I think maybe there's a slide as well that shows the eels there too. I like that picture. Um, so in the zoo, um, it isn't made at all apparent to visitors um, that the eel has, has a very difficult and troubled history in this place. Um, and it's not made clear to visitors either that, that the eel has been very recently and still kind of caught up in this dog food scandal. 
um, in the news media, the dog food controversy was was declared a national shame. Um, the government seemed to be quite slow to act, although um, Jan Wright, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, um, did commission a report investigating the commercial fishing um, of the longfin eel, and there's been a judicial um, review or inquiry into the roles, rights and responsibilities of the Ministry for Primary Industries on one hand, um, and the Department of Conservation um, in respect of the eel. Um, and there are further reviews that are set to follow this kind of a paperwork process that's in motion. Um, the crisis of the eel, I sort of think of as a PR crisis as much as anything. Um, so what appears to have been at stake here um, is the continuing marketability of this country as a producer of primary goods for export um, as, and um, as an eco-tourism destination, I think. Um, and it's notable that the issue has largely been dropped by the media in the three years since the scandal broke. So there have been um, just a few isolated um, attempts to raise public awareness about the eel. Um, there was a travelling patchwork quilt um, and a children's book and a very small march on Parliament. Um, but really, the public at large haven't mobilised in support of this creature at all. There's a kind of a discernible lack of feeling about the eel. Um, I think part of partly what this indicates is that um, the nature of the crisis is also one of pattern failure. Um, the story of the longfin eel fails to fit the conventional model of a settler conservation story. So there are conventions um, that are usually used to tell these stories that permit um, the need for settler culture to intervene in rescuing a species, um, permit this to be construed as a shame, like a pity, um, but the notion that shamefulness, like um, disgrace or mortification, um, might have anything to do with this um, can be suppressed. And the pattern enables settler culture um, to focus on species in isolation, like the, the kakapo or the kiwi might be kind of classic examples. Um, but it means that the story never has to amount to one um, of the shame of willed ecological degradation or wholesale life world collapse. So the crisis of the longfin eel is a story that threatens shame um, in a lot of different ways. And there are several elements, I think, to this story. Um, we can think of the species, um, the, the eel or the tuna, um, as both an object and a symbol of long history. Um, so the life expectancy of an eel is around 80 to 100 years. Um, this eel is only going to spawn once at the very end of its natural life. So the eel um, humanises the, the time scale of changes um, to the New Zealand environment and the eel has elder status um, in some areas of the country. Eels themselves are the oldest living inhabitants. Um, a second thing to say might be that the migratory habits of this species speak of intergenerationally imprinted memory. Um, so juvenile eels travel from um, the spawning grounds near Tonga where they're born um, to the fresh waterways of New Zealand, um, where their own parents and grandparents lived. Um, they follow the scent of their ancestors to live in the exact parts of the country um, that their own ancestors had lived in. Um, they cross dry ground when they need to, um, and in old age, they complete a reverse migration back to these deep ocean um, spawning grounds thousands of kilometres away. So um, these feats, I think, make these creatures um, remarkable exemplars of an instinctually driven um, will to life, I want to call it. Um, as a species, the eel sits athwart categories that usually calibrate what needs cleansing from the biosphere and what needs saving. Um, because the eel was understood to be a trout killer, um, acclimatisation societies deemed it a vermin species right from the off. Um, there was a bounty on eel carcasses. Um, and while commercial uses for eels have been developed, um, particularly since the mid-1960s, um, hostility largely prevails. So even when this dog food scandal broke, um, the, the eels themselves were being described in, in revulsive terms um, in the news media as um, ugly and slimy and serpentine and wily and phallic and all these sorts of things. So um, the species um, instantiates 
um, qualities that just don't appeal to settler culture. I think I can't see there's any any possibility that an eel is ever going to be um, on one of our bank notes. <laughs> um, a fourth thing to say might be that settler culture posits firm biopolitical distinctions between animals and humans. Um, so interspecies relationships are characterised by the exertion of human control over animals, um, and those animals will be exploited wherever possible for economic gain. Um, so in the absence um, of notions of um, kinship and connectivity and reciprocity that sustain um, indigenous worldviews, settler culture can't easily reconcile the ideas that a single species um, might simultaneous, simultaneously be um, for eating, like sustenance, um, a responsibility, a tāunga, um, a source of mana and, and a guardian as well. Um, and I think the fact that the management of eels falls between um, the jurisdictions of these government ministries um, for primary industries on one hand and conservation on the other um, is a discomforting reminder um, to set the culture that extractive activities, economic imperatives and ecological outcomes um, are yoked together. Um, so the eel, I think, is, is doing the work of, of revealing some of these things. Um, eels also reveal larger problems associated with um, settler colonial life world reordering, I think, especially settler attitudes to water um, and to the drying out of country as well. So um, there's a kind of carve up of the environment that, that, that eels expose. Mm -hmm. um, according to tribal worldviews, um, a waterway is an indivisible entity and it's a source of identity and mana. Um, but drawing on um, the English common law um, idea um, of, of a kind of divisible um, um, environment, settler culture holds that the discrete um, concepts of bed, bank and water um, apply in determining rights and ownerships over waterways in this country. Um, and there's a kind of carve up as well that manifests um, in the remapping of waterways into differentiated zones of protection. So in order to complete their migration, um, an eel might start off in conservation land, but have to travel down through waterways um, that are not um, under conservation jurisdiction. Um, they, they are open game, um, subject to hydroelectric dams that have deliberately not had eel passes installed into them. Um, and it turned out when this crisis um, erupted in, in 2011 or 2012, um, that licenses were in fact being issued by the Department of Conservation for commercial harvesting of longfin eels in conservation lands. So even in protected parts of our country, um, eels themselves were not subject to protection. Um, large scale swamp drainage um, is, is another issue connected with the eels. So, um, so this has drastically shrunk, shrunk um, the, the available eel habitat. Um, eels point us towards um, the set, uh, investment in firm dry ground, um, whose value is going to reside in its um, farmability and settlability and saleability. So, so these kinds of things I think the eel shows us. Um, and as apex predators um, within New Zealand's fresh waterways, um, eels function as bioaccumulators of toxins, um, so they evidence degradations um, brought through the spraying of herbicides, the clearing of pasture, for instance. Um, there's a commentator um, who noted um, that, that only South Vietnam has been doused with more 245T, which is one of the two precursor um, substances in the manufacture of Agent Orange. Um, so only South Vietnam has been doused um, with more 245T than has been sprayed um, in New Zealand. Um, and these chemical contaminants leach directly into waterways. Um, and, and so what, what this turns out to be is not just a war against native ground cover um, in pastures or paddocks. It turns out um, to be a, a kind of a war against the whole world of life, as it were. Um, so there's sort of a death disorder um, that I think the eel starts to help us see. Um, and what the eel seems to reveal, I think, um, is, is the limits of settler conservationism, um, settler attitudes to the environment, um, and settler lawmaking itself, I want to say. Um, there's a lot 
um, to, to say about the eel um, as a lawmaker, as, a, as an entity that, that kind of brings about um, laws or, or ways of living in place. Um, so the eel pulls into being um, a codified system of sustainable action in place um, according to iwi custom. Um, eeling activities are governed by each tribe's fishing calendar. Um, special talismans are used to preserve um, the luck of the fishery. Um, eels can't be um, sold or used for commercial gain because they're understood um, as a gift from the life world. So um, there are rules around eels that instantiate um, responsibilities that are owed um, to the life world. Um, and they point towards what Deborah Bird Rose calls um, living powerfully in the world, um, which is based on nurturing the relationships that um, that you're enmeshed in um, yourself, your own becoming is enmeshed in. Um, so the eel embodies forms of knowledge, um, forms of law in which patterns of life are embedded as care, we might understand. Um, the problem here is that the memory that this creature instantiates um, is, is really destabilising and unhappy for settler culture, I think. So this is a creature um, that tells us that New Zealand doesn't work somehow or that it's founded on something um, really disturbing. Um, and maybe if we could just have the next slide, please, Melanie. Um, really extraordinary um, photographs of eels uh, emerged from Christchurch from the, the kind of flooding um, event that Christchurch experienced in the first half of 2014. Um, this picture is a long, thin eel swimming down a residential street. Um, there's not very many things in that photo. Um, an eel and some water um, and a road and a, a car in the corner. Um, but these things don't all seem to belong in the same frame, sort of a, a, a kind of a picture that's really off in, one, in a, a kind of a strong sense. Um, one reading of the image might be that this eel is lost, that it's somehow lost its memory and it doesn't know where it is. Um, but alternatively, we might think of this eel as a creature of long memory. Um, one of the things the eel does is to remember and re-diagram this place in relation to a Pacific homeland. Um, and the eel remembers and enacts what this place was like um, before settler culture um, drained the swamps, dried out the land, carved the place up, um, rewrote and reinscribed it into um, tradable um, geometric shapes, agronomic patchwork, and so on, um, and then quarantined the eel in the zoo um, as a relic from the past of this place. Um, so this animal we might understand, I think, as performing um, memory work, and we can think of it as a, um, a bearer and embodiment of living memories. Um, which is it's sort of undoing things about this place that we might think we know. Um, I'm going to say some things about possums as well. I could maybe have the next slide. Um, I'm currently working up an article on possums, um, which are, are really demonised creatures in this country. And I think really um, maybe just the possum, you know, maybe it's just a bit misunderstood or something. Um, my specific interest is in this Australian brush-tailed possum um, and what I term the eco-pathologies of settlement that surrounds it in New Zealand. Um, the possum was deliberately introduced here and now serves as an icon of disease and contagion, like a life world made sick. Um, and I was at um, Taronga Zoo in Sydney last week um, doing field work, marvelling at the fact that there are possums um, housed in the zoo there, because um, I've never seen a possum <laughs> in a zoo before. Um, our zoos and sanctuaries are fortified against this creature. Um, we have electric fences and barbed wire and tracking tunnels and bait stations and, and any number of devices um, to try to keep um, these things out. And in fact, I think the only dead creature in the exhibited in Auckland Zoo is a possum. There's a possum skin hanging up in a replica trapper's hut. Um, so, so I'm sort of um, struck by this creature um, and the way that we banish it. Um, and I'm collecting data about this um, at the moment, um, looking at zoos and sanctuaries um, in New Zealand. Um, as I go about this, I'm really interested in the way that um, images and ideas of this creature um, circulate in, in, in the public domain. 
Um, and I'm sort of struck by this so um, picture here of the brush tail. And if you can, can you just flip it to the next one? Um, this is how the same species has been represented um, in the great Kiwi possum stomp, which there's actually another picture. We could just go to the next one for a minute. Yeah, so this is um, this is the larger game um, that that this zombie possum um, is 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 the kind of main character in. Um, so this is an online game. Um, development of it has been funded by Landcare Research, Crown Research Institute, as part of a public environmental education initiative. Um, and my interest is in the work um, that's being done to make us see this creature. Um, as, as the monster that we see um, in these images. Um, the the brush-tail possum was introduced to this country um, deliberately and repeatedly from the 1830s through to the early 1900s um, with the intention of inaugurating a fur industry here. Um, possums flourished in this country but is widely and vigorously demonised here. Um, officially we're told that as well as browsing destructively on our forests, um, possums kind of attack and kill our native birds. Um, and it's a message that's strongly conveyed um, by the Department of Conservation. There's, there's a lot of sort of talk on the Department of Conservation website um, about um, the possum as this sort of leading pest species in this place. Um, possums are described as invading the nests of defenseless native birds. Um, and, and causing prolonged and tormented death. This is very um, kind of loaded language. Um, so this is the message that's pushed to the public. Um, never mind the fact that fauna is actually only a really small proportion of the possum's diet. Um, much more significantly, it was discovered in the early 1970s that the possum is a vector of bovine tuberculosis. So um, possums pose a direct threat to the national dairy industry, which has been um, used in turn to justify large-scale biochemical warfare against possums, um, especially in the form of the aerial drop-in of 1080 poison. Um, just to be clear, possums did not bring bovine TB to this country. Um, they are themselves a collateral um, a kind of victim of this disease. Um, but the anti-possum campaign, I think, is, is sort of complexly bound up with the possums idiomatic association with, with the art of playing possum or feigning death. Um, it's not actually something that our brush tail possum does. It's, it's associated with the American opossum, um, who's only a very, very distant genetic relative of the brush tail. Um, but I think the, the brush tail um, violates normative Western codes around death um, in that it refuses strenuous efforts to cleanse it, um, from from the Zealand's <coughs> ecosystems. Um, clearing possums from the bush just encourages more possums to come and live in the vacated space. Um, and as a vector of bovine TB, um, the possum acts in and after its own death, so it continues to communicate contagion um, even after um, it is no longer alive. So the possum um, is reviled as this extreme um, kind of symbol of a will to life which has helped to pervert um, the proper course of life in this place or something. Um, and the game that we're looking at here um, I think feeds on and heightens the animosity um, associated with the possum. The game was launched um, in 2013, part of an interlocking sequence of games that's been developed um, under the umbrella Aura, um, Save the Forest. Um, and this is a game that was named um, I think two years ago by the Guardian newspaper in the UK um, as one of the top 10 environmental games, um, science environmental education games across the world. Um, the game is downloadable from the App Store. Um, users are invited to like it and to post their scores um, to social media pages. The idea is that this game is going to go viral, I think. Um, and it's based on a space invaders um, or shooter kind of model. So, so players are tasked um, with helping this kiwi to defend its nest from the um, relentless onslaught <laughs> of these um, monstrous zombie possums in order to save the kiwi from extinction. Um, the game itself I'm interested in as a, um, a kind of a site or space of, of public instruction, public pedagogy. Um, players are effectively charged with setting up their own 
um, predator-free sanctuaries. And the game turns out to be patterned, I think, in some um, quite highly instructive ways. So it's set um, in a present moment in this country where zombie possums already exist here um, and they're already known to be a threat. Um, and the New Zealand native bush and New Zealand native fauna um, is already known to be um, a, a kind of value and, and something that's, that's important to protect. Um, so there's a convenient eliding here of this of this quite kind of difficult backstory um, to do with the deliberate introduction um, of, of this exotic species to do with manipulating um, a life world with the intention of boosting its commercial productivity or things that we might um, kind of associate um, with, with um, the possum. Um, <coughs> and we have um, a complex and self-reversing story of, of official attitudes towards the possum. Um, being elided here as well. So um, vast forest clearance that has been undertaken by settler culture. Um, the fact that the possum itself was actually protected by law um, in this country until the 1940s. We don't understand any of these things through this game. Um, another thing to say might be that the possum is made to stand for a host of other predatory introduced species, um, the rat, um, the stoke, the cat. Um, and so the possum is serving in this game as an environmental scapegoat. The possum um, is an easy target or a natural target, um, it would seem. Um, another thing to say might be that, that the game appeals to feel-good factors um, around native birds and iconic um, nature and not to the deeper drivers of national good um, in the form of agricultural productivity and biosecurity. So what's good for us um, is going to turn out to be a healthy economy. Um, that's, that's where health and welfare concerns um, end up being located in all of this, I think. Um, and, and another thing to say about this is, is it's really striking the way that it um, sanitises the violence that's visited on possums. So um, online gaming itself is often seen as a, a social kind of scourge. Um, or contagion in its own right. Um, somehow once it's harnessed to an environmental issue like this, um, its violence becomes strangely justifiable. Um, and the game itself um, uses visual icons. There are decoy eggs and slow bombs and these sorts of things. Um, but there's no 1080 poison dropping that's going <laughs> to implicate the whole world of life in this campaign against the possum. Um, there are no leg um, traps, there are no cyanide bait stations, these kinds of things. So there's an appeal here um, to ethical violence or clean death, um, which sort of warps or distorts our usual means of assessing what's healthy and unhealthy or what can be sanctioned and can't be sanctioned. Um, and maybe um, another point to make about this game um, is that bovine tuberculosis is not mentioned in this game. It's consistent with the tendency to downplay this in the public domain. Um, but the possums themselves and their appearance, um, I think, it strongly look like possums who are in um, the grip of this disease, the kind of physical um, um, representation of this creature um, as a sort of gangrenous, um, scary, swarming kind of thing um, is... is um, associated with this disease, I think. So the disease is simultaneously um, invoked and subsumed, I think, in all of this. Um, the figure of the zombie is, is a figure that's sort of all around us at the moment um, in film, on TV, in books, and literature, in, in academic articles, and everywhere you look. Um, a figure that, that instantiates some of the horrors of, of late capitalism, I think. That's why. Um, it works so well to describe um, the neoliberal university, these kinds of spaces. Um, the zombie is actually a, a kind of a product um, of, of colonial activity or new world and activity. So it comes from um, Haitian folklore. Um, it expresses concerns about slavery. So the origin of the zombie um, is in the belief of enslaved Africans brought to Haiti um, that a voodoo deity would gather them from the grave um, transport them back to to the African home like homeland um, after death, um, unless they had offended him in some way, in which case they would be doomed to slavery um, forever after death, 
as a zombie. Um, so we might think of, of the figure of the zombie as a figure um, who can't die um, and a figure who can't forget as well. Um, it is quite interesting to me that the possum, um, once it's, it's in the grip of bovine tuberculosis, loses its memory of how it is supposed to act. It sort of um, you know, becomes um, zombie-like um, in, a, in a real kind of way. It forgets that it's nocturnal, um, that it doesn't like open pasture land or broad daylight. Um, it stumbles out and gets sniffed and nuzzled by cattle who are naturally quite curious. Um, which is how the disease is spread. And I think if you go down in the slides, maybe, oh, this is the American opossum is playing, playing dead. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at maybe the next slide, so this is a, a, um, um, a possum um, spreading bovine tuberculosis. And if we just go to the last slide, maybe, mm -hmm. um, it's like the, the, the least awful photo I could find of a possum. Um, that succumbed to bovine tuberculosis. Um, so, so this possum, um, its memory is scrambled by this disease that it's subject to here. And I think what the possum um, does more largely is to reveal the scrambled life world around it. So it's um, exposing um, the really strange erraticness of a new country um, whose newly introduced species, um, like cattle and possums, um, can't properly coexist in the same space. Um, I think as well, maybe just as a final point that I'll make for today, um, some striking parallels between possums and settlers for me begin to emerge out of this picture. Um, so like the possum, um, the settlers' memory of, of kind of who they are and how they're, they're supposed to act in that place um, gets scrambled in some key kind of sense. Um, settler and possum um, are both working to um, to um, destroy or, or remake local habitat. Um, they secure their own settlement through reproductive or demographic dominance. Um, they're resourceful and territorial. Uh, possums don't like to live with too many other possums. They, they sort of like their own quarter acre block, um, which is why <laughs> possum clearing um, is so ineffective because it just opens up new territories for possums to come and inhabit. Um, so they have these kind of atomized social structures that I think um, mirror sort of Western ideas of how, how people um, might live. Um, and they're figures of death, the possum and the settler both. Um, so figures associated with death who are also seemingly uneradicable, can't get rid of them. Um, so the deeper problem here, I think maybe, um, is that the possum represents something that's really alarming and distressing to settler culture, um, which is settler culture itself. We might understand um, the possum standing as a surrogate or a proxy for the figure of settler. And so the success of the possum's establishment in this country has to be disavowed. Um, there's kind of a key question of affective connections that comes out of all of this, I think, the extent to which um, you can identify with or sympathise um, with the possum or what it might mean um, to picture yourself as, as a possum person, for instance. <laughs> sort of a question um, that I'm working with at the moment. Um, and, and there are um, other ways, of course, that you might make sense of this species in New Zealand. Um, I'm especially interested in iwi commentary about what kaitiakitanga or guardianship um, of the possum might properly involve. So um, Kevin Prime, um, who's the environment coordinator for Matahine, um, has offered the following perspective. He says, um, a pre-European council of elders would have accepted the possum as a bountiful food source, um, eaten its meat, brains and innards, used its fur for cloaks, used its bones for needles and adornments. Um, he says such a council would definitely have observed the habits of possums in relation to the moon, the weather and seasons, um, had possum included in the hunting and harvesting calendar, caught and used possums as pets and decoys, um, and declared a rahui or ritual ban when possum numbers fell below a sustainable level to allow the numbers to build up again. Um, and it's interesting, I think, I mean, this just seems a strikingly more um, responsible and respectful approach uh, to the possum. The larger message here is to do with um, responsible use of a resource and care for a wider world of life. Um, but I think it's hard to see this message 
I'm catching on. It's just not going to make for such a, a dramatic animated game for anybody who's, who's going to watch it or play it. Um, cool. So that's maybe what I have to say. I mean, there's any number of other stories that I could offer around um, other species um, who, who kind of throw up the difficulties of this place. Um, but, but I'm happy to leave it there for you. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> okay. Um, that's fantastic. Do we have <coughs> some questions and comments from people? I'd just like to say that was great. Yeah. Oh, there were so many things about that that I connected with in terms of there's a PhD student in um, my department that's doing work on the zoo. She's doing, she describes herself as a humanimal. Humanimal? Yeah. Um, right. Geographer. Right. And um, she would have loved to have heard what she was talking about. Then my colleague who um, I've got a master with, mm -hmm. um, she's got an interest in settler processes of um, colonisation and decolonisation in settler societies. But I also um, was thinking my brother works for Doc. So he's <laughs> killed lots of possums. <laughs> and, um, and it's interesting to think about when, when I lived in Australia and seeing possums around and the, the, that sort of affective response to a possum mm -hmm. that isn't in a trap or dead. Yeah. And yeah, or because roadkill. Or roadkill, because just the way we've come to see it. I like the idea of thinking about settlers as possums. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then the other side of it is, I, I really liked your work on, on the tuna as well, be, and mm -hmm. because I've been involved with my iwi in different, it, and it's a different perspective. So, mm -hmm. I did, in, in terms of thinking about when you're saying that the, the tuna looks ugly or whatever, and it does. Mm -hmm. I was involved in the fisheries reference group where we use the tuna to describe the parts of the fishery plan that we put together mm -hmm. and things like that. So just the different perspectives and hearing, you know, the corridor around how tuna migrate and come back and all these mm -hmm. other sorts of things, and uh, just great. I just loved it. It was fantastic. Oh, thank you. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's funny to think of my brother killing possums. <laughs> there are, um, I didn't show that there are a lot of um, like tutorials on YouTube about how to skin a possum, and they're quite they're really disturbing for the sense that you can sort of pull off the possum's coat and what's left. When I was um, 14 on a school camp, some boys were scaring the girls with pretending to be a possum, and then they caught a possum and they killed it in a very brutal way and skinned it, and it. How New Zealand is that killing a possum yeah. on a school camp? Yeah. And it, like a disregard for the life of the possum. Yeah. And actually, New Zealand was in trouble. There was a school that was in trouble with PETA, the International Animal Protection Authority, mm -hmm. um, over possum throwing oh. at a primary school. Yes, there. And this dressing was, up dead possums. Yeah. That's up over dead in the Kaimais, over in yeah, Bay of Clinton. And yeah. them as well. It's in, yep. Sort of bring, Dead possums and see I how referred to that in a lecture once about the dead possums. So they had this day at this primary school where they would dress up dead possums. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that one of the girls in my class, her mother taught at that school. Right. Amazing. The rest I, of the I class were like them. horrified at these little kids dressing up dead possums. Mm -hmm. And then so, possum, yeah, yeah, I don't know why I'm talking about that. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. I love that um, linking the settler and the possum too. That's wonderful. And the whole, you yeah, have so many beautiful concepts and phrases oh, there yeah. that are so rich and powerful. You know, I love the idea of a scrambled, mm. a scrambled life world, mm. you know, created by settler colonialism. Mm. It's fantastic. But I, and I also liked the idea of the, 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 that discomfort that the tuna has mm. when thinking about settler mm. society and the things that we have done yeah. um, mm. to enable... To, yeah, that species. Yeah, and yeah. and that species as the collateral. Yeah, you know, it was it was cast as the collateral of settlement. And I think mm -hmm. um, the eel. I mean, in in sort of pursuing the work on that, it sort of feels like you reach a point with the eel where this place is just awful, <coughs> and, and how uh, how do we function here? Or, or, you know, if we imagine that the eel really could teach us mm. how how to live in this place. If you followed the eel, started with the eel, um, a whole different um, version of this place comes into, comes into view at that point. It's a really striking um, um, species for me in that regard, just mm. the, the, the sort of ability that it has to to, to kind of um, re-diagram mm. this place and, and disrupt it altogether. I did an exercise last year with a class talking about eel um, and I got them to draw really like a map of New Zealand um, and, and we sort of put a blank piece of paper over that so you could just see the outline 
and then tried to picture these eel pathways um, mm. sort of from Tonga through to waterways in country mm. and back again. So rather than um, the kind of positivist map of New Zealand, mm. what happens if I if I produce the diagram or the map that the eel might produce for me of this place? And it's this really strikingly mm. beautiful mm. Um, kind of filigreed um, um, image that has very little at all to do with this, the kind of certainty of New Zealand that we mm. think we have or know. And I just love the idea of, of a creature that, that mm. enables us to think about this place in those ways. Do you know about Dan Hikaroa's seminar on Thursday? No. In anthropology, no. Thursday afternoon. Uh -huh. He's talking about the, um, the Pacific, talking about right. the ocean, mm -hmm. um, you know, from a Māori perspective <coughs> or a Polynesian perspective, but it's from a Māori perspective in terms of, you know, probably ways that you would like mm -hmm. to mean, like, if you've got time, yeah. this sort of oceanic connectedness. Mm. And yeah. A moment of flip where instead of the land being important, it's the waterways. And, mm. the, and, and all that connected mm -hmm. connectedness of everything through the ocean and the kind of, I, and I think he, in the abstract I read this morning, he's, he, he talks at the bottom about the, the way that the uh, Whanganui River is, you know, has been given this legal status in mm -hmm. the um, settlement and thinking about the challenge of doing that, something like that, for the Pacific. Mm. 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 So yeah, that, you might be really interested to come to that if you can. It's on the Anthropology Seminar Room, which is on the 8th floor of Human Sciences, 4pm. I could send you the thing. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Margie, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, it was brilliant. I just <laughs> loved it. Thank you. It's such a treat. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing I really like with the, the public pedagogies and the zoo is a, a, a mm -hmm. machinery for memory and a machinery for emotion as well. Mm -hmm. but, but the thing I like better, I think, is that you're not just sort of charting the ways in which uh, that works, but you're developing a kind of ethics. I hear you mm -hmm. developing an ethics mm -hmm. that, in a sense, you're going past that the notion of the scholar as a sort of neutral commentator mm -hmm. to actually intervene in this kind of politics of memory and emotion mm -hmm. and suggest these new kind of figures and these new um, parallels and symbols and so on, yeah. which I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I really like that. There's yeah. some really powerful, I mean, I'm sort of struck by influences or who do you look to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm interested in these kinds of creatures and who do you look to at this point to, to understand how to, how to write or think or engage. Um, and there's a really powerful Deborah Bubo's mm -hmm. in Australia who works really, um, mm -hmm. really important to me. And um, the guy called Tom Van Doren, who's just working in extinction studies. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some really, really powerful work mm -hmm. um, that's coming out of Australia in particular. It seems mm -hmm. to be a, a real um, sort of um, hub or, or mm -hmm. kind of seedbed for, for this mm -hmm. kind of work where. Um, you know, where, where academics are um, standing back in this discussion mm. in this way, as if you could ever not be engaged or involved in the thing that you've chosen to research mm. and write about. Mm. Um, and I think it's it's been really helpful for me in, in imagining how to work up this kind of project to, mm. to look to examples um, mm. there and, and to see how, how people talk about things. Yeah, I think that, that that layer could be more explicit mm. in a way. I mean, um, I also heard you a bit as um, almost at times doing a sort of psychoanalytic reading of trying to suggest the you know the ways in which something stands as a scapegoat or mm -hmm. a sort of I'm less convinced you know I'd, I'd like to see that argument developed um, mm -hmm. more and I think it's probably, you know for me it's not a sustainable way of understanding how emotion and effect work in the public realm mm -hmm. or as a certain social basis for emotion mm -hmm. so you know. The thing I loved much more was the sense of an explicit politics or ethics or kind of critical analysis mm -hmm. and a, and a self-conscious sort of reworking of the iconography mm -hmm. of the animals mm -hmm. and the culture. Mm -hmm. Human, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Interesting. And I think yeah. probably my tendency to look for symbols and frame yeah. things as scapegoat, you know, it's partly to do with the background in literary studies. I think we you sort yeah. of get away with those manoeuvres, mm -hmm. but. Um, it, you know, interesting to to um, the work that I'm, I'm I'm engaged in at the moment is a lot of research into um, my time in tribunal reports and mm -hmm. reports from the parliamentary commission mm -hmm. for the environment. Like, there's a lot of different kind of sources mm -hmm. um, and and quite official sources that you can turn to to to, mm -hmm. to make a you know to back up a point that if you're mm -hmm. trying to make it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. Do you find 
find on her is the company that CCs you know, um, stuff that all useful. I, find I yeah. actually teach a bit of her stuff. There's a um, an article of hers that's sort of it's sort of great and it's sort of awful at the same yeah. time. It's on she's talking about the um, the sculptural artwork of an Australian artist called Patricia Piccinini mm. um, and this work is very um, um, like little creatures and sort of wombat type things but they're really awful in ways that sort of make you, um, you know, mm. I've done talks where you put these up on the screen and the whole <laughs> audience is sort of vomiting and gagging. <laughs> but um, and Donna Haraway talking about these species and, and the sort of techno culture um, and fabulation side of these, but also um, they they're creatures that come out of Australia, or mm. you know, mm. kind of um, Pechenin's working in this space, and, and the idea is around um, kind of future environmental futures mm. and and kind of question of care and ethics and and what do we choose to love or how do we mm. know what it is that we love or we <laughs> have these technologies that are producing these kind of Frankenstein things and and we have to be able to care somehow for, for what it is we're doing here. So mm -hmm. um, that's the, the kind of side of the work that I've mm. um, engaged with. That's the ethical side. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, she's certainly a, a, a mm -hmm. concept in, in, in mm -hmm. studies who, mm -hmm. you know, you can't not be aware of, of the contribution mm -hmm. she's made. I'm interested in monkeys as well, which is sort of a side project maybe, but this um, New Zealand's a, a, a kind of a world leader in um, um, primate rights. And are we? We are apparently. <laughs> and because it doesn't matter to us. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry? Um, yes, I think exactly because it, the monkeys don't matter. So yeah, so so the rest of the world goes to New Zealand to our um, <laughs> care of, of primates. <laughs> Because yes. Janet's scratching her head. <laughs> <laughs> she might like to say something too. <laughs> Janet, do you oh, want to say, I just aware the time is... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I just wanted to just, you know, that's just fabulous. Thank you so much for that. And I really loved it. Um, I've written about eight or ten pages of notes. <laughs> and I've just been to two conferences dealing with animal issues and my own organisational studies and I learnt more in one hour than I did in my entire Europe trip I just spent three weeks doing so <laughs> <laughs> that was just fantastic I just wanted to um, ask you, um, you you mentioned Deborah somebody as a key person can you who, what's her last name I'm not I didn't catch it so her surname is Rose R-O-S-E like ah okay Oh, but she's got a middle name, Bird, Deborah Bird Rose. She goes by Bird. As okay. As in a thing that flies. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. So I just wanted to look her up. And I also wanted to ask, um, just in terms of settler identity, uh, I know it's quite a strong theme in literature studies. I'm just wondering how you're framing your um, settler identity concepts. Um, have you got any key people? I'm just I'm just looking for ways I can get more into this area, really. Um, I do a lot of close work with Stephen Turner, who's written a lot mm. about settler identity in New Zealand. His work, okay. um, he and I, I mean, we kind of do work together. Okay. We've been operating in this space for longer than I have been. Okay. Um, right. And he, I think, is is a really important figure in ways that I aren't really recognised yet. I think yeah, yeah. I tease him about how posthumous he's he's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's a, a figure, he's sort of talking ahead of, you know, in yeah, ways yeah, that, yeah. that this place isn't actually ready yeah. yet. And I sort of have that sense a bit about myself when when I, I sort of um, produce um, the things that I produce that maybe this is really um, too difficult to hear right now and more time has to pass before... Um, people are ready to hear this maybe um, but he's somebody he's a really important okay. figure, I think for me and in that space <laughs> in scene um, Joe Smith who's at um, she's based at Vic um, in film media and TV and works in I think she's got a Marsden on um, on screen indigeneity okay. um, she's done a lot of work in the settler okay. space as well so she's somebody who I would consider a really um, okay. um, good figure for talking about these issues in New Zealand. Okay. Um, and people like Deborah Bird Rose, I mean, her work in Australia is very concerned with settler 
um, issues and questions. She talked the dingo is one of her yeah. um, her kind of special creatures, and um, and she's very interested in flying foxes as well. Yes. Um, and other species. There's a really powerful piece she's written about donkeys okay. um, called Ju Judith's Work, um, yeah. which is incredible. It's about um, the way that donkeys get culled. Um, I think I might have heard yeah. of that one. Yeah, I didn't know that was here. Oh, amazing okay. story about yeah. um, radio transmitting collars and, and the use of, of a Jenny with a radio transmitting collar around her neck. Um, you know, the aerial kind of shooting oh, yeah. of donkeys um, that will single out the one with the radio transmitting collar as not the one to kill. Mm. Um, so the cull happens and then she's left because donkeys are social creatures. Um, she's left to go and find more donkeys to live with and then yeah. a later, okay. another cull will come and take yeah. okay. a short yeah. story about a creature who will eventually self-isolate even though she's a social creature. creature yeah. Tragic. Yeah. Of, of always having her companions. Yeah. Well. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's a harrowing story and, Bird, and Deborah Bird Rose's entry, part of her interest in it is that the donkey, even though it's not endemic to Australia, um, it's a, a species that has been embraced by Aboriginal mm -hmm. cultures, so um, a bit like mm -hmm. the possum in New Zealand, you know, these sort of lines of connection. It doesn't it doesn't matter necessarily um, for an indigenous population whether the species was there from the beginning or not. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, are, there are responsible or ethical ways um, to have a relationship with the creatures mm -hmm. in the world, and, and that's not one of them. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> it work. I mean, um, I'm trying to think. There's a book called um, Wild Dog Dreaming, I think is, is one of her recent ones, okay. um, to do with love and extinction. Um, and there's a really powerful book by um, Tom Van Doren called Flight Ways as well, which has to do with um, his interest is in birds. Oh, wow. Really, really powerful work. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, brilliant. Give me some more stuff to read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I mean, we're going to have to, we have made yeah. carry on talking, but we're going to yeah. have to um, finish this. But thank you so much, Anna. I mean, we were really lucky that us five. Oh, we no, got to really hear these fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Thunder up, really. That's a treat. Yeah.